Hello. I uh, basically uh, came from, uh, let's see, can't go back. I came from uh, New York, right behind me, just yesterday, to Pittsburgh. And uh, this is maybe uh, an image that's in your memory of uh, this Superstorm Sandy that actually occurred. And it actually created an entirely new neighborhood. You've all heard of Soho and Tribeca. Well, I lived in Sopo, south of power. Uh, for about two weeks. I worked in Sopo for two weeks, tried to work. Um, it's somehow interesting that almost a calamity has to happen in our cities before we really begin to think about what are the underlying infrastructures and how do they work. Uh, because in this instance, the city of New York realized it needed to do something about climate change. And um, what was interesting about the areas that flooded during Sandy, if you go back to the New York that the pilgrims first sort of uh, arrived and looked at, and, uh, or perhaps the Vikings before the pilgrims, then you know, everything that was actually granite and the island of 1650 remained dry. Everything that's been sort of man-made and infilled flooded. Canal Street was a canal. Water Street became the edge of uh, the city again. So what happened is that the Housing and Urban Development Department with the Rockefeller Foundation held a competition that stretched over a year and a half where they asked for designers and entire teams of engineers to think about the entire Northeast Corridor that was affected by Sandy and come up with solutions. This was not a competition where you were given actually a brief. They asked you to figure it out yourself. They asked you to find the site. They asked you to pose the problem, and they asked you to actually solve it. And that was a really interesting thing to be in. And what we actually took was Lower Manhattan as our site, all the areas that were flooded, and we created the Big U, uh, literally a sort of protective berm uh, an infrastructure that would basically provide the kind of resiliency against climate change and sea surges that stretch from West 57th all the way to East 42nd. So literally, the area that was blacked out would in the future be able to be lit. And we see it as kind of uh, the High Line, which is an existing infrastructure, a railroad, and then placing the urban amenity or public park on top. So ours, the big U, became sort of the dry line, the same way of thinking of actually a protective infrastructure that then also becomes a public amenity over the entire 10 miles that it protects. That basically infrastructure can actually think about the people it will serve. It thinks about the activities that those people actually have. So that, I mean, what exactly does that mean? Well, you know, you need to protect the city to up to 15 feet of, uh, of surge in, uh, in these kind of climactic events. That's sort of the hundred year storm. And instead of a wall that sort of disassociates people from their city, the idea was to actually create urban furniture, a bench. That bench could become a stage. The stage could start to sort of activate with a sort of a public life, a bike path, uh, a kiosk, um, and that it basically becomes integrated into the city. So what you see behind me would happen about 99.9% .9 of the time, people activated and uh, using the infrastructure that is actually there as a piece of urban furniture. And then in those instances of storm events, it would then also protect the city. So um, we actually were uh, awarded as one of six winners of the competition. And I'm proud to say that of the 10 miles, two miles has now been funded by the Housing and Urban Development Department to the tune of $335 million. So this is, again, something that a year and a half ago, Manhattan would be considered perhaps one of the laggards in terms of storm resiliency or climate change initiatives. And through Sandy, the superstorm, um, actually has catapulted into sort of a leading position of actually looking at how public space and how the public agencies can work together, and in this case also with the private landholders that are along the edge, and come up with solutions for the city. We call this social infrastructure, the idea that the people and the infrastructure 
are actually thought about simultaneously. Uh, one of our first projects, the Copenhagen Harbor Bath, um, is actually another demonstration of what social infrastructure is. It also means that you don't have to spend a lot of money to actually create some pretty cataclysmic change. This is Copenhagen, which is Copenhagen means the harbor to shop. So it is literally a city that is built on commerce, much like Pittsburgh. And that commerce, which always was right in the middle of the city with the canal, created a situation that all of the industry was on that canal, pumping all of its residue into the canal. It was a canal you didn't want to live close by because it smelled, because it had all of the sort of poisonous residue that factories and commerce actually produces. So people lived very far away, five, six blocks away from the water. But then the people demanded change. And in the 70s and 80s, they asked these, uh, these kind of cement factories and soya warehouses and, and different places to sort of get out. And so slowly, through grassroots efforts, the city started to demolish those plants along the main canal and started to think about it as actually a space for the people. Now, it's called Copencabana. And you actually go down to the edge of the water. You can take an entire promenade and walk for you know, six, seven kilometers from one side of the city to the other. And you're now passing cultural amenities. Even the water quality was something that was important to the city of Copenhagen. It took them 10, 15 years. But through passive means, through algae and other instances, they actually cleaned the water. And then to celebrate that the water was clean enough to swim in, they held a tiny little competition, 300,000 euro, to build a bathing platform. And that bathing platform was our first project as architects, big. And we basically uh, created that place that the city never had and really changed the people's perception of that part of the city. Suddenly, the real estate prices around the harbor bath rose by 50% because suddenly it was a place that was desired to actually be and to live. Another social infrastructure project that we've worked on is the Danish National uh, Maritime Museum. It is an old, abandoned uh, shipyard. This is Helsingør. It's about an hour north of Copenhagen. And this is what the soul, this is the commerce of that city. And it was for hundreds of years, built about on the backs of building wooden ships and then steel ships. It had eight berths that you could actually build these ships. And uh, when globalization happened, those industries re were removed. They went to Korea, to other parts of the world. And the city lost its soul, lost its mojo. And these uh, dry docks were wet docks because they were just filled in with water. Well, the city made and did something about it. They had a master plan that was called Kulturwerftet, or Culture Harbor. They uh, went and applied for the UNESCO World Heritage designation for the castle, Kronborg, which is the setting of Hamlet in Shakespeare's uh, play. And these things, these first initial steps, started a chain reaction of change, where the industrial buildings suddenly were reused. Similar buildings like this were made into theater or performance spaces. And uh, we were given the task to take one of these dry docks and make it into the home of the Danish National Maritime Museum. Instead of filling the dry dock, which was actually what the competition asked us to do, we decided to dig up around the dry dock, place the museum on outside, and let the hole or the, the, the space actually become a part of the exhibition. So here you can see how the, the dry dock almost becomes like a donut uh, of a program. And you start up at the top, and you walk all the way around. And it's all on a slope. So you're always like on a ship. You're never quite straight. You're always on a slight angle. And you're learning about the very proud heritage of the Danish Maritime Museum and uh, maritime uh, traditions. So. The museum could not stick out a single inch from the actual ground floor because of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. You couldn't impede the visual sort of connection. 
So the entire museum is actually nine floors underground. And um, you walk across these bridges. The bridges also provide shortcuts from one gallery to another. And uh, the space is actually left open 24-7 to the pub public. Anyone can come down there and activate that space. Inside the museum, this is the stair that takes you straight back to the top. And you have a cafe that's also publicly accessible. And you can see this sort of marriage between old and new and really refreshing these buildings that uh, have served a whole other purpose uh, inside. So what you need, and I think several of the speakers today have already uh, touched on this, you need to activate the people, the citizens. And the way that we do that in our work is that we call this sort of extreme public participation. Uh, this is a project that's actually not a building. It's the space between buildings. Now, in Europe, much like in Pittsburgh, basically transportation sometimes takes over. Here it's freeways, in Europe it was railways. And these railways, they cut large swaths through the downtown areas, cutting one neighborhood from another, really allowing for one neighborhood to suddenly be kind of decentralized and as such have a disadvantage to any of the other more central neighborhoods. That was the case in this neighborhood. This was the swath of the rail. Uh, once the cars came in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, the rails were yanked out. Light rail was sort of replaced with uh, buses and, uh, and cars. And so these became leftover spaces for, for decades until the city decided once again to look at these spaces and to do something about it. And here, the idea was to take one kilometer of this space and to start to think of it and program it. Now, this is one of the most multicultural neighborhoods uh, in uh, Copenhagen. And what we decided to do was to actually ask the people who live there to tell us about their objects, the, their favorite benches, their favorite fountains, their favorite lampposts. So we broke the, uh, the one kilometer into the red square, the black market, and the green park. And then we listened to these uh, different uh, people and asked them to tell us and share with us all of these great, wonderful things. We collected 108 objects, and as architects, we became curators of space. We placed these objects into their locations. Even the landscaping, even the palm trees are from China and literally can grow in a Scandinavian climate. So you actually can see not everything made the cut. The city decided not that this swing was a little bit too crazy. <laughs> um, but the swing from Baghdad is now in Copenhagen. Uh, this is a slide from Chernobyl that we had to like rebuild because this one was uh, a little bit too much radiation. But we have the real red sign from, red square sign from Moscow. We have bollards from Ghana that are now in Copenhagen. We have benches. This is also a wonderful sort of study about people. This is a bench from the Mediterranean region where two lovers look at each other in the eyes and tell each other how much they love each other. This is a bench from Belgium. Remember, the EU is in Brussels. Everyone looks in different directions and never talks to each other. Um, here we have a nice little uh, plaything from Japan that a Japanese uh, citizen in Copenhagen remembered as a child. And from America, the donut sign. So that's now in Copenhagen, celebrating donuts, basically, that you can't actually eat. And then if you need to go to the dentist, this is the dentist sign from Qatar. That's now in Copenhagen. So these are the people who actually asked for these things and objects to be coming to uh, uh, their place. So it is a park by the people for the people. And these are all things that are actually made, in our case, possible by the, uh, the sort of the support by Rildania that actually presented this morning. And as such, Rildania is actually a foundation that works very intimately with architects and designers to think about how the future of a city can be. We were given the task of actually thinking about the next 40 years of Copenhagen. Copenhagen is built like the hand that you see here. It is made up of the downtown area and then light rail that comes out. And this hand has actually functioned and worked so well over the past 40 years that you can literally see how the city looks 
just like that hand. And then the green parts between the fingers allow you to bring the parts all the way into the center of the city. We have created a new light rail that actually crosses the hand across the knuckles, which you see in the yellow dotted line. And in the future, we see that as actually a potential of actually really uh, thinking about how the, the future development of the city could be. That the light rail and that the transportation company can actually become a development company so that you would actually develop the stations as the highest density along that route. Even the area underneath the rail has potential of actually being developed. So you use the station to slow the train down and to speed it back up as it goes to and leaves the station. So these are things that we feel we can actually provide sort of visions and, and ways of actually working together. I have just one more project to show, and then I'll be out of here. But the idea here is actually that we didn't stop with just thinking about Copenhagen and trying to solve that issue. We took it and took it all the way over to Sweden and thought about the entire region of Denmark and Sweden and how transportation could actually solve that problem. For the first time, you would have pink in a flag uh, with uh, sort of Denmark and Sweden sort of coming together to actually work on something. The scale of Copenhagen, Helsingør, Helsingborg, and Malmö working together is the same scale as Oakland, San Jose, and San Francisco. So it's uh, thinking about how you can actually think on a regional way of making that happen. And to finally sort of say that, um, or I'll close it there because you need to it's finish. It's the right line. It's the right line. <laughs> Hedonistic sustainability. You can't. You can't really. Uh, can't do better than that. The uh, listen. Just one question. Sure. The, the, you have a great. Your, you and your firm and your partners have such a great capacity to imagine experience, and that's sort of like the the rock solid core of your capacity. And for people to imagine what they don't even necessarily know they want. Yes. And so I'm just wondering how you sort of like you know you're you've now worked in a variety of ranges of cities and so forth. I'm not asking you to think about Pittsburgh per se. But like, as you sort of imagine, how do you make that dialogue work? What is the sort of secret sauce in the conversation that you have with folks to kind of both get their ideas, but also help some new ideas uh, come up? Um, I think it's one of engagement and one of communication. Mm -hmm. So you have to be open and listen, and you have to then take what has been said and actually use that as your kind of data point or your start. Um, I think that maybe design and designers sometimes are viewed as someone who comes in and comes in with a grand scheme and kind of just puts it out there as an artist. Um, I would say that we're more seen or we see ourselves as facilitators. Facilitators in the discussion that communities and the public and the private sector, the public sector actually have. And so what we try to do in the work and, and in the way that we work is to listen, to analyze, to prioritize, and then to basically offer some solutions uh, that we can then work together to, to find uh, that are workable. Great. Thanks a lot. I need, I need, to, I need to take this from you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah.